As temperatures drop, tensions are on the rise over a simple garment that we all use to protect ourselves. Hear how one group of anti-jacketers is leading a growing movement against the use of coats and fleeces despite their proven effectiveness from the cold. From the Onion and Onion Public Radio, this is The Topical. I'm Leslie Price, and I say it's time you liberate your ears from the tyranny of headphones and blast this news at full volume for everyone to hear, even if you are in public. So crank up that freedom and stay with us. Hypothermia is a hoax. Chill doesn't kill. Chill doesn't kill. Hypothermia is a hoax. Chill doesn't kill. Chill doesn't kill. Those were the sounds of a demonstration yesterday in Schaumburg, Illinois, where dozens showed up at an anti-jacketer rally outside a Burlington coat factory to protest what they're calling the, quote, liberal cold weather conspiracy. OPR's Marcy Hammond joins me now with more. Hello, Marcy. Hi, Leslie. Marcy, what do we know about these anti-jacketers? Well, Leslie, these citizens are part of a new movement who believe that dying from the cold is nothing more than a leftist hoax made up to control Americans by making them wear very restrictive thick layers and puffy sleeves. I spoke to protest organizer Dennis Crane, and here's what he had to say. The chances of actually dying from the cold are incredibly low. Fewer people die from the flu every year than the people who die from the cold. This wear a coat nonsense is all one big plot laid out by the fur coat wearing liberals to force us into wearing these stupid things. Well, we know better than to, than to be afraid of what the fake news media says about the weekend forecast. No one's gonna bundle me up. This is America. And despite the dropping temperatures, these anti-jacketers have started protesting all over the northern states, showing up in droves, wearing t-shirts and tank tops. I spoke to a few of them, and here's what they had to say on the issue. All this cold weather is just going to disappear in a few months anyway. Plus, coats don't even work. They can't stop the cold from spreading, so there's no point in wearing one. God made us warm-blooded for a reason. First, it's pea coats and capelets. Next, they'll have us wearing scarves and hats and mittens and snow pants until we can't grab things with our fingers and we boil from the inside. Sir, are you okay? Your fingers are turning black. Do you want my gloves? Get your straight jacket of tyranny away from me. Wool coats are for sheep. Sheep! They certainly sound dedicated to their cause, and those things can get pretty hot and uncomfortable. But Marcy, we should note that coats and jackets have been scientifically proven to trap heat around the body and shield us from the wind. That's right. But these anti-jacketers are quick to argue that the only people who actually benefit from wearing coats are the frail elderly and people whose bodies just run cold no matter what. Mm -mm. The situation outside Burlington Coat Factory really escalated, though, when a group of counter-protesters made up of concerned mothers arrived. Let's take a listen. What are you doing? You'll catch your death. Get inside right now, young man. Huh? Because that's what'll happen. Oh and God. then you'll be sorry. Seen? Have you ever heard of pants? Maybe some long pants? Maybe a glove? And who has to take you to the doctor? I have to take you to the doctor. The counter-protesting mothers were completely bundled from head to toe, pleading for the anti-jacketers to at least put something on their heads. Both parties, however, eventually dispersed once the store closed, except for a few stragglers who collapsed from hypothermia and froze to death. Well, sounds like a mostly happy ending. Well, not really. People died. Yeah, I guess. Thanks for the report, Marcy. That's OPR's Marcy Hammond. Back in a moment. We're starting today's edition by jumping straight into OPR's ongoing coverage of the Monsanto Lab disaster in Socorro County, New Mexico. The sprawling agrochemical lab has been on complete lockdown for seven hours now as security personnel attempt to capture a rampaging tomato that broke free from its containment vessel earlier this morning. OPR senior reporter Rebecca Neal is joining us now from the scene just outside the lab in New Mexico, where the situation is still ongoing. Rebecca, what can you tell us? Leslie, around 8 a.m. this morning, Monsanto Biotechs went to the lab's isolation vegetable chamber to perform a routine aspartame injection into the tomato, only to find the six-inch thick glass receptacle that housed the tomato ruptured from the inside. And tragically, they also found the chamber's four armed guards lying dead on the floor, with shards of tomato vines sticking out of their necks and vital organs. Here is audio of one of the biotechs calling in the breach to the dedicated emergency line at Monsanto headquarters in St. Louis. Uh, we've suffered a code 9 containment breach in the isolation vegetable chamber. Looks like it was a tomato. Four down. Is the tomato in custody? Negative, but there is a pulp trail leading to the ventilation shaft. It could be anywhere. Shit. My god. Copy. Initiating lockdown sequence. 
The tomato still remains at large, and sources tell me its unusual size and strength due to weekly experimental fertilizer injections has made it hard to apprehend. Mm. It's boring through concrete walls by emitting a concentrated form of citric acid and leaving gallons of unremitting viscous secretions in its wake, drowning 11 people so far. My God, how long can the tomato go on like this? The tomato is strong, Leslie. Remember that Monsanto vegetables at a baseline level are modified to have bulletproof skin and a shelf life of more than three months. I'm told some fear it's indestructible at this point. And where is it now? Well, according to the latest security footage, it has found its way to the lab's germination wing, where it is currently peacefully devouring a generous supply of mulch. Well, why don't they go after the tomato now that it's sedentary? They tried to send a SWAT team member in during its mulch break, but it did not go as planned. Here's an audio recording from the attempt to contain the tomato. Warning, this is chilling. Outside the germination wing, approaching the door. Jesus, my nuclear readings are off the charts, and oh, uh, oh God, I feel like my skin is burning. Ah, dude, I, I see the tomato growing through the window. It's ah, it's burning my eyes. Oh. Sergeant, unseal oh. the door and carry ah. on. You'll be fine. Copy, sir. Ah. Unsealing wing door and. Ah. Sergeant, Sergeant, are you there? Motherfuck! Did he? Did that SWAT member explode? What did I just hear? Unfortunately, the SWAT member was immediately vaporized by the radioactive emissions beaming off the tomato. Apparently, the tomato is now dangerously radioactive after burrowing to Monsanto's underground waste site, where vegetables and fruits that register too high in plutonium are dumped. Security personnel were prepared to evacuate the 2,300 employees on lockdown inside, but now with fears of radiation exposure, those plans have been put on hold. Complete chaos. What does Monsanto have to say about all this? They released a short statement today from their St. Louis headquarters. Despite today's unfortunate events, there is still hope for the escaped tomato specimen to be safely recaptured, rehabilitated, and then marketed under the trade name Ruby Gold Delicious, which will be juicy and delectable for all seasons. Thank you. Ruby Gold Delicious. Hmm, sounds delicious. Well, I wouldn't get too excited, Leslie. Sources say despite the company's statement, and especially after the tomato appeared to grow opposable thumbs, there's no hope to capture it. Mm. I'm told that Monsanto has no choice at this point but to bomb the entire facility via a thermonuclear airstrike with the tomato and all employees inside. Well, I mean, that's the only thing you can do at this point. Tragic, but necessary. Thanks for the report, Rebecca. And, uh, hey, make sure you get outside that thousand-yard radius of the facility pronto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Yikes. Put that pedal to the metal, girlfriend. <laughs> okay, we'll be back after the break. On this Thanksgiving, we're learning a little bit more about those who first celebrated the festive tradition and what they can tell us about our own biological shortcomings. Researchers at Boston University believe they have traced the American obesity epidemic to a single heavyset passenger who sailed aboard the Mayflower. OPR historical health correspondent Joyce Evert joins me now with more. Hello, Joyce. Hi, Leslie. So what can you tell us about this startling discovery? Well, Leslie, through an exhaustive analysis of genetic samples, ship logs, and tattered medical records from the early 17th century, researchers have determined that the majority of severely overweight individuals in the United States today share key genetic markers that were passed down from a 327-pound Plymouth Colony settler named Jeremiah Alden. Huh. Here's biologist Alan Fortner explaining how this one particularly hefty passenger gave rise to the elevated BMIs of modern Americans by landing on Plymouth Rock in 1620. At a time when the average European male weighed perhaps 135 pounds, Jeremiah Alden's tremendous size was an exceedingly rare trait, which is indicated by contemporary accounts of him as, quote, a great wall of flesh and as wide across as three men together. After carefully sequencing DNA from Alden's remains, we determined that it was he who introduced a predisposition towards slow metabolism and sedentary personal habits into the American genome. Wow, it's extraordinary to think that my own tendency to overeat and aversion to exercise could go all the way back to the Mayflower. That's true, Leslie. And it wasn't just food. Jeremiah also appeared to have a healthy appetite for women and fathered as many as 15 children in different settlements. Ooh. From there, his descendants moved all over the country. 
In fact, a related genealogical study has shown that Jeremiah Alden is an ancestor to nearly 70% of the entire population of Chicago alone. Huh, I thought it would have been more. However, Dr. Fortner says that living in a country where over 62% of the population is either overweight or obese almost didn't happen. Here he is again. Though he counted for only one of the Mayflower's 102 passengers, logs kept during the voyage claimed he had, quote, near devoured rations set aside for one man's entire voyage before setting sail from England. The passenger goes on to add that, quote, ye slothful fellow who erupteth through his waistcoat with girth, ye sweat always upon his crimson-hued face, ate our lot of salt pork, the crew grows mutinous, my own wife Constance, gaunt and scurvy, may perish yet while ye idle Jeremiah consumes three and twenty biscuits by noonday. Mutiny on the Mayflower was, of course, avoided by the passengers eventually signing the Mayflower Compact, which created a temporary set of laws and strict portion sizes for the new colony. Mm -hmm. We also know that Jeremiah Alden did, in fact, attend the first Thanksgiving in 1621 through the diary of the Mayflower's captain, Christopher Jones. Here's Dr. Fortner reading from the captain's pages. Mr. Alden had the breadth of many men and eats as such, without nary a mite of shame his wide, fleshly hands eternally imparting morsels unto his happy mouth. The savages were angered and cried out, for Jeremiah went back for double, treble, and quadruple servings of wild fowl and maize. Yet he merely shrugged and smiled in a bashful way, in accordance with his generally joyous and agreeable comportment. Well, the natives shouldn't have made Thanksgiving buffet style if they were going to get upset about that. Now, Joyce, is it possible that Jeremiah brought over more epidemics than just obesity, like, say, irritable bowel syndrome, or having nipples that go inward? Um... No, there is currently no evidence that would support that, nor any evidence that either of those are an epidemic at all. Oh, well, just figured I'd ask. But what we do know is that while Jeremiah certainly set our nation on the wrong path in terms of excessive weight and unhealthy food choices, we must all take responsibility for our own health. Otherwise, we might end up just like Jeremiah, who died of a heart attack at age 46 after being accused of witchcraft. Ugh, that would be the last thing I need right now. Thanks, Joyce. That's OPR's Joyce Everts. Back in a moment. I covered the rest of this news in bacon to make sure it stays extra moist. And now it's time for the gravy. Here's what else you need to know today. It's been two weeks since the United States honored its military service members by celebrating Veterans Day, which is why so many were confused this morning by the sight of a sweating, pantsless Rudy Giuliani emerging from the tomb of the unknown soldier. The former New York City mayor appeared both flushed and a little famished, wearing nothing but his underpants, but insisted that there was nothing to worry about as he was simply paying his respects to our fallen men and women in uniform. A disturbing sight to see, nonetheless. And big news ahead of tomorrow's holiday is the nation's ants have officially announced their 2020 Thanksgiving boyfriend roster. Both over Zoom and in person, single ants from across the country plan to unveil what they believe is their strongest rookie class of middle-aged romantic partners ever at this year's Thanksgiving dinner, and are even hinting that the release of several prominent boyfriends from prison might provide a welcome shakeup during this year's festivities. The nation's ants also announced their plans to honor those who led the way by memorializing all the boyfriends who passed away over the year in four-wheeler accidents and belly flop contests. And finally, in some news that could disrupt your Thanksgiving dinner, Mr. Big Shot Chef over here has announced his plans to smoke a turkey this year. Well, don't let me hold you up there, Wolfgang Puck. Wouldn't want to get in the way of you and your fucking Michelin stars. And as for the rest of your family, don't worry. Still plenty of time to order in before tomorrow. And that's the topical for today. I'm Leslie Price. Folks, if you absolutely insist on seeing the people who mean the most to you in this world tomorrow, please remember to do it responsibly, with your mouths and nostrils closed at all times. No exceptions. Breathing is how we got into this mess in the first place, and just because it's a holiday doesn't mean it won't kill you now. And just in case it is the last time you see your family, be sure to tell them about the topical. Maybe even play them an episode or two. They might really enjoy it. And if they do, they can even sign up to become a member of the topical 
Topical's Patreon, where they'll have access to all kinds of exclusive news content. And for those who sign up to become a member of our $10 tier, I'll even thank you by name or whatever kind of comes out of my mouth naturally live on air. Today's shout out goes to Andrew Wagster and Stacy Fewis, as well as a member of our $25 tier, The Joe Finn. We here at The Topical are thankful for your support and wish you and your families a very happy Thanksgiving. Unless, of course, you're Jewish, in which case, happy Hanukkah. Oh, and Daniel Trice, don't think I didn't notice that you deleted your $5 contribution this month. I hate to break it to you, but it's going to cost you a lot more than 5 bucks to pay for those penis enlargement pills. So before you come crawling back next month, maybe think about everything you've been taking for granted in your life and all that you should have been thankful for. Tis the fucking season, asshat. And to everyone who isn't Daniel, I'll see you right back here tomorrow for a very special Thanksgiving episode of The Topical. We'll see you next time. The news doesn't stop just because this YouTube video has. For even more on all the worst things happening in the world right now, listen and subscribe to The Topical on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, you insatiable news freaks.